You know, there's a lot going on. Back when uh, God gave me a prophetic word in September during the Feast of Trumpets that this was a time of of repairing, rebuilding, and expanding, I, I didn't really... Uh, you know, sometimes God gives you something, you really don't understand the full import of that which he is giving you. And yet I have seen God consistently doing, in fact, this week I've got to uh, do a podcast because we're, we're kind of rotating our podcast. I do an interview, then I do a teaching, and I started with repair. And we need to get into rebuild and expand. And this morning I want to kind of build upon that because I think 2015 is going to be pivotal. I think that it began during Feast of Trumpets, and I think after we get into the biblical New Year, uh, right around Passover, that things are going to excel, and what we need to do is to learn to position ourselves for what God's going to do. Because, you know, if something begins to accelerate, you have a choice of either coming in line with it or getting left behind. The last thing you want to do is have to get into an all-out sprint to get back to where you should have been if you would have heeded what God was trying to speak to us. Uh, You know, in in some sense, I I find that, you know, I've been on vacation here for a week or so, and I'm busier than I have ever been simply because there's this God is just opening up so many things, and and I'm doing these interviews with uh, with some guys on on the podcast, and I've got to read their books before I do the interview, and it's just like God's just putting things together, and that's even before my real interviews kick in with the books that are that are coming, and there's this, and I'm beginning to feel God beginning to want to birth two other books uh, from me. Because I think the Shinar Directive was just the beginning. It was an introduction for people that had never really understood end-time prophecy or understand where things are going on. And I wrote it for those who aren't listening to all the different podcasts with all the different things that are going on with with end-time prophecy. And it was like a general introduction. Well, once that introduction is out, it's time to get into some real detail, into some real nitty and gritty of both how the kingdom of darkness works, how that we live in a prison planet today, and how that God wants to set us free. I believe that as we move toward the end time, although things are going to get a little rougher, can can you see that kind of in in what's going on in America and in other nations? It's going to get rougher, but at the same time, I think we're going to get freer than we ever have been before. It's time for us to become that bride without spot nor wrinkle, for us to, to mature, to become the wife of Christ instead of just the bride of Christ. It's time for us to at least get in, into uh, puberty, you know, uh, to, to become uh, moving into the place where we're maturing. It's time that we quit acting like children. And I think for a part of the body of Christ, what I have seen are a bunch of teenagers throwing hissy fits, and it's time for us to go ahead and mature into adulthood. And I I think to do that, we need to align ourselves. We've got to rebuild. We've got to repair, then rebuild. And in this rebuilding process, before we can expand, people want to expand, but they don't want to repair and rebuild. And so what you do is you expand your infantile behavior, you, you expand your bondages, you, you expand all the wrong things, that's why you got to repair and rebuild before you expand. Because I tell you what, the Holy Spirit's getting ready to show up like an inspector when you build something, and he's going he's gonna to walk up to a lot of people and say, everything that you thought you built was on the wrong foundations, we got to tear it all the way back down to the ground, dig up the foundation, put in a right foundation. Before you, because you do, you refuse to repair, you refuse to rebuild, and what you're building on, what you're expanding on now, is all the wrong things. And and how many know that? As far as I'm concerned, I'm getting too old to build on the wrong things. It's time to get serious about what God has called us to do. Let's go to Ephesians chapter three, verses thirteen and fourteen this morning. And I want to ask you, what are you pressing toward for 2015? Now, you can choose to be like a stick floating downstream in the rivers of Babylon, or you can choose to flow upstream until you get to the currents of God and start swimming toward Jerusalem, start swimming toward the things of the kingdom of God. You have to learn to fight the currents that are in the earth today, and those currents are getting stronger. But let me tell you something, when you learn to fight those currents, you gain strength in the process, and we're going to need that strength ahead. Now, here the Apostle Paul is talking with those in Philippi, and he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, 
but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth for those things that are before, I press toward the mark of the high of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now you, you got to look at some things that are going on here in Philippi. We we have, and I believe that what we see in Philippi, we had ones coming in that are saying, "I'm more Jewish than the Apostle Paul, and I know things more than the Apostle Paul," and begin to begin to push circumcision again of being able to boast in the flesh. Those of us in the 21st century look and think, well, he's opposing Torah because they came in pushing Torah. There's only one aspect to Torah that he had a problem with, and that is circumcision of the flesh. You don't have to become physically Jewish. And then he boasts prior to this in in Philippians. In fact, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. I want to just kind of bring you up to, to speed on what's going on here. Because he's having to correct them, and at the same time, if there was anyone that could probably boast, Paul was an unusual critter because he could boast of things in the flesh, and then things he did in zeal toward God that weren't of God when he persecuted the church, he could hang his head in shame at the same time he could, he could kind of stick his nose in the air. There was both going on with him, and, and, verse, and, and starting with verse 1 of chapter 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it's not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of consention. For we are, of, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I the more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. In fact, he was third generation Pharisee from a very wealthy family, studied under Gamaliel. So he was the elite of the elite. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was, when he persecuted the church, he had such stature that he was able to get a writing that allowed him to go into any Jewish community and arrest any Jew that was following Messiah. How many know that just any Joe doesn't get that? Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now listen to this. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. How's that for Torah observant? But what things were gained to me, those I count for loss, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And having been found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the righteous, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of faith by God that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might obtain the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained, either are already perfect, but I follow after, if I may apprehend, for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, but I count all things as loss. And so here he is, he said, listen, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I did all these things. I, I have a lot of reason to be puffed up in the flesh as well as I have a lot of reasons to hang my head in shame. How many of us can say that of our own lives, that we have a lot of things after the flesh that we can say, you know what, I have arrived. I, I'm it. I, I've got this. And at the same time, we struggle with this dichotomy that there are a lot of things that we could hang our heads in shame that either we have been involved with or things that have been done to us. And so the Apostle Paul is dealing with a lot of these things, and he is saying, listen, there's got to be a transition. Now, if anybody could have said, I have apprehended, I've arrived, it was the Apostle Paul, because not only did he have, being trained under Gamaliel, being from a wealthy family, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a third generation Pharisee, all these things, after he, he... he slams into this, into this revelation of who Jesus is when Jesus knocked him off a donkey. You know, you want to talk about being introduced to Jesus. The apostle Paul was so, so zealous about what he was doing. Jesus had to slap him off a donkey and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? 
And then he goes into the desert for three years. He's back studying Torah, studying the prophets. And Jesus takes him into the third heaven and begins instructing him and giving him what we call the Pauline revelation. Let me tell you something. On the end of that, there are a lot of preachers today that would say, I have absolutely arrived. I have been taken into the third heaven. I spent time up in heaven. And Jesus came and I went through the school of Jesus. He taught me everything that relates to the gospel to the Gentiles. I have arrived. Top that, all you esoteric bums and all you Gnostics running around thinking you have had visions. I have had the main man, Almighty God, come and school me and reveal to me how Moses and the prophets all fit together with what he's done. But yet the Apostle Paul says, I don't think that I've apprehended it yet. <laughs> you think you got it all? We are most of the time, even, even some of us that really consider ourselves as doctors of the word, because I've been watching a lot of things. The more I get on, on Facebook and I just watch this dialogue, those of us that call ourselves apologists or theologians or experts, and this includes myself in, in, in putting this, I realize sometimes how we have this tenacity for childishness. And it's time to put away childish things. Because we, like the Apostle Paul, need to realize that we have not yet apprehended. Now, in the Greek, and, and today I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to impress you with Greek words this long. I'm just going to give you the definitions. Because it isn't in how you pronounce it. It's in knowing and understanding what it means. Now, this word apprehended here, and for you to be able to look it up, it's Strong's number 2638 in the Greek. When he says to apprehend, it means to lay hold of, to lay hold of also as to make one's own, to obtain, to attain, uh, to take into oneself a, a, a appropriate, to seize upon, to take possession of. Now, this same word apprehend, it could be like if you were taken over by an evil spirit. But on the good side here, it says, in a good sense of Christ by his own holy power and influence, laying hold of the human mind and will in order to prompt and to govern it. So he is saying, there's this process going on where I'm trying to reach out and to grab Jesus and to grab the knowledge of Jesus. And at the same time, I realize Jesus is reaching out trying to grab a hold of me. Because I'm wanting to have that excellency of the knowledge of Messiah. And at the same time, the Messiah is trying to grab a hold of me so that he can begin prompting me and governing me instead of the mystery religions and the Babylonian system that's governing this planet. Can I get a witness this morning? How many know that we need to realize we're, we're not there yet? We are not there yet. So why are we sitting idly by, doing nothing, expecting this to just hit us on the head like a ripe cherry falling off of a tree when that's not what, that, is not what the, that is not the paradigm that the apostle Paul puts forth? There's a struggle to get there. There's a work to get there. There's a striving to get there. Salvation was free, but maturity is going to cost you. To get completely free, spirit, soul, and babble of uh, spirit, soul, and body of Babylon is going to cost you. You've got to reach for it. You've got to strive for it. You've got to fight to beat one off and to push yourself into the other. Because if you if you allow yourself to float without any struggle, you'll be sucked right back into Babylon. That's true. So to to realize that I'm not there yet, turn to your neighbor and say, "I'm not there yet." So if you're not there yet, it's time to roll up your sleeves and get to work. That's what I think God is telling us in 2015. I've got to repair. I've got to rebuild before I can expand. I've got to, I've got to realize where I really am, get rid of the religious language and all the high-sounding sound bites that are really pathetic because I'm having people give sound bites thinking that that is an expression of the spiritual reality within them when all it is is vain and empty words. It's time that our words reflect the reality of where we are. As well as saying with the Apostle Paul, I see there's so much more. I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm counting everything else in life as done just to get there. Are you happy yet? I'm already happy. 
He says, now I need to realize that I have not apprehended, but he also says I've, I've got to become forgetful. I am forgetting those things that are behind. Now, the Greek word here for forgetting is really interesting. I think that Paul chose it because he realizes how the psyche works. Because it means to forget or neglecting to no longer care for, to no longer take care of it. To the place where it is given over to oblivion. Because what do we do? Both our accomplishments and both the things that hold us back, the hurts, the wounds, that's why forgiving is so powerful. We need to forgive those who have sinned against us because until we do, that hurt serves as an anchor to hold us in the past. And all we do is go over that and over that. We're caring for it. We go over it and over it and over it in our mind. Or past successes, we go over it and over it. Well, I don't have to strive in Christ because I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. You know what? It's all done. I need to no longer tend to it. I need to identify it, grab a hold of it, nail it to the cross, consider it as dead, and no longer continue to care for that thing, but allow it to go on into oblivion because you have to empty your hands before you can start laying a hold of what Jesus wants to do in your life. Whether it's good or bad. So the best of us have nothing to boast that's got to be crucified in Christ. The ones of us that have been the worst before we got saved, that needs to die in Christ. Those of us that have had the worst done to us before we discovered Jesus, those things need to be nailed to the cross as well. You you don't ignore them, you identify them because you you can never nail anything that you won't put your hands on and identify. You've got to identify it. You've got to take it to the cross, and it's got to die with Christ. You've got to see it there with him on the cross and nail that thing there and say, I no longer care for that. I won't tend to that. I'm going to let that go into oblivion because I've got to empty my hands because God wants to fill them with better things. And I'm not talking about materialistic things. How many know that you can drive a Lexus and be so in bondage and be so filled with filth and rage and hurt and all the wrong things? And then thank your somebody. That's not what I'm talking about. There are things that are of great of God that the world can't give to you, the world can't take away, no matter what goes on around you. It's what's in you that sustains you, that God puts in there that sustains you when the world goes wonky. And how many know the world is going more wonky every single day? It's time for us to learn to put these things into oblivion. But he doesn't stop there. Listen, he says, Now, brethren, I count not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So he's leaving something behind at the same time. He's throwing these things off. He's identifying them. He's crucifying them. He's letting them go into oblivion. But And some people just stop there. But the apostle Paul does. He says, I'm reaching forth for something. Now, this reaching forth unto is one Greek word, and it means to stretch out or toward or to stretch oneself toward a goal. Come on now, you got to leave behind before you can reach forward. There's this stretching of oneself. We've got to learn to stretch our faith. We've got to learn to break out of mediocrity. We've got to learn to break out of this, out of this mully grub that the world is this spiritual funk that the world of Christ thinks that they're in, and it is time to up the game. It is time to really learn how to pray. It's time to really learn how to worship. It's time to learn to stretch because, you know, what? We, what this entire atmosphere of the world that we're living in Satan is called the spirit or the God of this earth, the, the, the ruler of the power of the air. He fills all the currents, almost all civilization, except for the Torah, which is our quandary when we get into, um, my next book's going to be called The Watcher Files. And when we get into everything, every civilization, every aspect of civilization was drawn from the knowledge of the watchers from how to build cities and all these different things, to line them up with second heaven powers, to line them up to the archons of principalities and powers to draw power from it. All these things and economies and everything else are all lined up with ancient watcher technologies, and the only antithesis to it is the Torah of God. 
on how to build a civilization that lines up with the third heaven, not the second heaven. And so what we're going to have to learn to do is we're going to have to learn to press into God, press into his word, press into prayer so that I can bore through the second heaven and connect with the third heaven. And that my obedience, my coming under the blood of Jesus, my wanting to honor him begins to build a conduit through the second heaven into the third heaven. And heaven begins to flow and begins to manifest in the earth room. That's why there's the stretching forth to know him and to know the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and to know his power, to know his glory, to know his resurrection power, to know all these things. I've got to stretch through the second heaven until I connect fully and establish that connection into the third heaven. Does that make sense? And see, that's the goal. That's the goal. Because he says, not only am I reaching forth, I'm pressing. I'm pressing. That word pressing not only means to make, to run, or to flee, to put the flight so that if, that if you make the devil run from you, he's pressing away from you. How many like that one? Submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's, the same, that, that's derived from the same word here that we get here that the Paul used to press. But on the flip side, it means to run swiftly, in order to catch a person or thing to run after, to press on figuratively for one who is running a race swiftly to reach a goal, and that goal is Christ-likeness. That goal is Jesus. So I've got to stretch at the same time I'm pressing into something. We have got to consciously, in 2015, be stretching and pressing into Almighty God because Babylon is beginning to influence more and more and more. And if I'm not careful, I'll get swept away into that current in the last days unless I'm stretching and pressing. And the goal. Now Philippians 3.14 says, pressing toward the mark of the, of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Amplified says that I press toward the toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. It's time for us to learn how to live life by the heaven realities of who Jesus is and what he has done for us in the third heaven. We have got to bore through the second heaven and get that done. I don't know about you, but this, this just made me happy. You see, because the, the goal, what's the goal? Well, the goal is Christ. The goal is Jesus. The goal is Messiah. At the same time, I am stretching and I am pressing towards spiritual maturity. Come on, and I mean, that, that's, that's a whole can of worms right there because a lot of the ones that I see claiming spiritual maturity, and I'm not saying that I have arrived. You know, sometimes I can be Dr. Leck and the Greek and the Hebrew says this, but I mean, there's certain things in my life that if you step on my, my, my spiritual immaturity will rear up and I'll slap you down if I'm not careful. Come on. I won't respond in love. It's like I'm going to hurt you then pray for you to be healed later. We, I, and if there's ever a place to see that happen, just watch some of the conversations on Facebook. Because you are, you are kind of anonymous, you're on the other side of the planet, and you can say these snotty things, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, well, blah, 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 blah. And it, it, it's like a bunch of kids slapping each other. It's cyber slapping. <laughs> and, oh, and, oh, what's worse is if they, if they name you in one of them. Because it just takes a life of its own. I'm, th- I'm thinking, Facebook needs to have a kill button. Just kill that threat. I don't want to know another thing that's said about it. I don't care that there was 590 other comments or shares about it. I just want it to die. Yeah, somebody, somebody needs to teach me how to turn that thing off because I look at Facebook, 249 likes or shares or comments. I'm thinking, well, man, people are getting in the word. And all it is is a big snot fest. And I'm thinking, somehow or another, 
It has launched me back into spiritual preschool. And I'm trying to press toward college in the kingdom of God. Grow up. It's time for spiritual maturity and learning to put aside childish things and pressing on toward the mark. It's also a greater knowledge of Christ and the word of God. Get in the word every day. I don't care if it's two or three or four or five verses of all you have time to. I am learning that, you know, there's, there, there, you, you can actually purchase podcasts that are nothing but them reading the word. Put it on your smartphone. It's a whole lot better than some other things you can put on your smartphone. And let it read the word to you. Going down when, you're, when you're doing dishes, you can listen to the word. I, I've, I've got to the place where I'm doing stuff around the house. I'm folding laundry while I'm on vacation. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to all these different things. I can't get enough. I could care less about so much of the stuff that's on TV anymore when there's so much to learn, there's so much to, to understand. And right now the Holy Spirit is pouring out an anointing for comprehension of spiritual things. Why waste it on Babylon? We're under this window that God says, if you'll stretch and press, I'm going to stretch and press towards you. And I'm going to release the knowledge of the word of God. It's time also that we stretch toward bringing every enemy of Christ in our lives under our feet. You got to bring your wounds under your feet. You got to wear, you got to, you got to take that easy button. I always talk about the devil has in your life. It's time to disarm that thing and put it underneath your feet. There are some demons that have been harassing you for years. It's time to get victory over them and put them underneath your feet. See, there's a reaching toward Christ. At the same time, there's reaching toward this thing's neck, grabbing it, identifying it, binding it up, and taking it and nailing its power to the cross. Because you're in my way of what I really want to reach for, and that is Christ. And guys, it's time for us to mature into becoming a greater testimony of God's grace and power in the earth. The stuff right now that's going on and some of the dialogue that I'm seeing is not a testimony. And if we're going to fight for stuff, let's actually fight for stuff that's clearly in the Word of God that goes beyond a soundbite. It's actually documented, and the current of it you can find all throughout the Word of God. I am tired of Christians taking things out of context, ignoring basic hermeneutical principle for whatever sounds good to their flesh. It's got to flow from Genesis to Revelation. It's got to have Jesus in the midst of all of it. And if Jesus wouldn't do it, the Apostle Paul wouldn't do it, maybe you shouldn't do it. If you never see the early church do it, maybe you shouldn't do it. Just an idea. I want to return to the book of Acts because the book of Acts is really the only thing in the New Testament that we have that doesn't have an ending. Every epistle has a closing. The gospels have their closing of Jesus resurrecting and ascending on high. But the book of Acts, it's like here is the first episode of the book of Acts church. And now heaven is waiting for us to come in line to what they were then before we can go on to that book and be finished. Because it's not the acts of the apostles, it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. He's not done yet. He's not done yet with you. In fact, the Holy Spirit, now I'm going to say this, the Holy Spirit has, has got to the place where he's just kind of folding his arms and he's waiting. When you get serious about me and quit playing games and, and worry about goosebumps and you actually want to roll up your sleeves and work with me and really submit to Jesus and to submit to the word, I'll start working with you. But if, I, but if you won't do these things, I'm not really going to move and you're allowing another spirit that just gives your flesh a puff up, begin to move and you begin calling that the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is here to convict, here to judge. He's the convict of righteousness, judgment. He's to teach us all things. But when we get to the place where we don't want to hear it, he just stops. He says, call me in four years after you've been through hell and back when you're ready to actually hear some things. I, you know what? I would rather not go through hell and back. I'd just rather face the truth, cry and weep about it for a little bit. Present it to Jesus, let him bring healing, repent of whether I was led wrong or something. I'm tired of my past holding me back. Aren't you tired of your past holding you back? I'm tired of bad doctrine holding me back. 
I'm tired of a lot of things holding me back. It's time for me. I need to have calluses on my hands because I have been working that hammer and that nail. And I want my cross to look like a pin cushion with a thousand nails in it. Every time I find something, I wrestle with it and I drag that thing to the cross and I nail it down. Because every time I do that, it opens up spiritual space within me for God to deposit something. There's displacement theology. They were supposed to go into the promised land so that they could drive out the ites so that God could fill it with what he wanted, his kingdom. And it's a, in a sense, it's a type and shadow of my life. I've got to get the ites out while I was in bondage to Egypt. All these ites moved into my promised land, which is inside. And I've got to drive it all out so I can establish the kingdom of God within. We have no right to think that we can establish the kingdom of God on the outside and take over political things when none of us have had the kingdom of God fully established within because there's too much flesh being manifested for a crucified life. Oh, 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 oh. I've commenced a medal in, haven't I? Well, you know what? Let's just stop right there. <laughs> It's time to stretch and to press on into Jesus and the things of God. That's the anointing that is being released in heaven right now. And either I can flow with it or I can resist it and pay the price of walking into more deception and thinking I'm having church. I want that church that when it prays, heaven moves. That there is a conduit established because I have completely submitted and I have a life of prayer, I have a life of study in the Word, and I have a life of obedience. I'm not looking for ways to get out of the Word of God. I'm looking for more ways to be obedient to it. And Jesus is the template. Jesus is the matrix for understanding all the Word of God. And the more I see him in the Word from Genesis to Revelation, the more I am like him because I strive to be by the power of the Holy Spirit, the more I begin connecting with heaven and glory can be given his name by the life that I'm living. That's where we're at for 2015. And Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that heaven would begin to move in the remnant, to begin to move in the people of God. Father, let us put away childish things and let us go on to maturity. Let us put away every sin. Let us lay aside every sin that so easily besets us because we are running this race and we are pressing toward the mark of our high calling in Christ Jesus, that we want to know him. We want to know the power of his word. We want to know the power of his kingdom. And Father, let every day, let it be an exercise of faith to stretch just a little bit more toward him and to leave the world just a little little bit more with every step so that we can function as citizens of the kingdom of God in the earth. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it this morning in Jesus' name.